You're listening to The Fat Cast, live from the studio with Colin Reynolds.
Good afternoon, you're watching the Fat Cast. My name's Colin Reynolds and uh, today's guest is uh, Mr. Alex Folby. Hello. How's it going, Alex? I'm good, how are you? Very well, thank you. A little cold, obviously, you know, Tasmanian winters are... Of course. Oh. Well, nice, nice to wear more clothes, nice to rug up. That's it. actually, I, I, I like the, the bomber jacket. Oh, it's thank you. Like this, uh, <laughs> it's not leather, obviously, but it's, it's got that similar vibe, that collar and, you know... I, I don't know if you're a gamer, but like Terry Bogard. Yeah. I can... <laughs> Oh, inspired by Top Gun, that's what it was. Oh, Which was yeah. the most recent one. That movie's <laughs> just come out, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen it. I, I, of course I watched the original. Mm -hmm. I actually watched the original at the cinema as a bloody child. Yep. What well, was it, like five years old or something like that? <laughs> and it, 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 actually, here, this is kind of funny. For years and years and years, I wanted to be a fighter pilot mm -hmm. in the Air Force. Um, you know, my school scores were good enough. That was no problem, but... Um, Anyway, uh, I changed my mind about it when I got to college. But the, 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 fu the, the funny thing is, it wasn't until like years later that I realised, hang on a second, this is not some organic dream of mine. This was manufactured. I watched the fucking movie Top Gun as a yeah. child. That's what made me want to do that. You know, I didn't just dream up on my own. Let's go fucking kill some people <laughs> for yeah. oil. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, I just love the soundtrack. That's the, that's the coolest oh, bit of it. Yeah. Soundtrack is so good, and um, I mean, obviously, there's the Archer references abound. Uh, there's um, a soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, the Street Fighter Two. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, right. So there's tons of Top Gun references in there. Okay. So you've got the entire character of Guile, mm -hmm. which is roughly based on sort of Ice Man. You know, he's got that look. And I mean, he stages the the airport and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. And then you've got Ken, who's of course an American character, Ken's theme music is from the Top Gun soundtrack. No shit, cool. Yeah, you know, no, it's it's like in that way that only the Japanese can. They take something, they change one percent of it, um, and then it's like a new thing that's not copyright now. Yep. And so yeah, it's like an original uh, computer MIDI track, <laughs> but yeah, it totally it's totally the song from. Sweet. Yeah. Well, it's like I heard. What was I watching? Um, Attack on Titan. They had the. Mm. They had a snuck a bit of the Halo theme into that. Oh. Into one of some of the bits of that, but yeah. Sure. Actually, the Attack on Titan's got a, some great music in there too. Totally. The um the the mother's theme, that mm. um like what the climax, that actual final melody that it, it, the whole thing's a build up to that one melody, yep. and it's it's the harmonic minor man. It's that sharp seven. Yeah, it's like my favorite fucking note, man. <laughs> so heart wrenching. It's, oh, it's, it's so awesome, good. awesome music. Yeah, and like um the original, they're, they're really, there's like about five or six different versions of the uh, OST release. Mm -hmm. But the first one had um uh, like just the the way the the order of the songs and the way the build up was. It's that one where, in terms of the story, you know, like episode one, like they've just busted through. And um, you've got that kind of, that fairly large one obviously goes after the mother mm -hmm. and like it's his nightmare kind of Titan. Yep. Um, the music that's playing whilst that's walking, it's kind of like this sort of like low boom, 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 boom. And like there's like this old, sort of like this crone. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know what you call that vocal style, but uh, it's got like this, you know, like this, elderly woman woman dying sorry crying for the souls of the young or something yeah. like this like there's this there's real pain in that sound well it's a lot like the i mean not just to, to keep on with the soundtrack thing oh. and an, an anime for that matter um uh akira the soundtrack a lot of the similar stuff like the vocal it's just so much uh, this huge percussion and all the vocals that go on in in that absolutely yeah, like a similar sort of thing, like all the crying and screaming, because it's just so. It, there's a lot of really guttural stuff in that. Definitely, and uh, the thing is, uh, there's like uh, a trope. So obviously, you know the what people now call the Axis chord sequence. Yep. They call it that because of the you know the video they made. Right, right. So anime has its own ubiquitous chord sequence. Yeah, I think I've heard about this. Yes, and it's the. Um, uh, uh, relative minor, flat seven, flat six. Mm -hmm. So for those at home who might understand a little bit, but not that jargon, if you're playing like A minor, G, F, or you'd be those three chords basically. But what's super common is like, so you'd play F, G, A minor, 
FG, A minor, FG, A minor. Like all the anime is totally that. Or it'll start on the relative minor and climb down and back up. But yeah, yeah. that's absolutely the sound. And somebody, I forget who it was, but he made a video on this. Oh, he's, you might have seen his videos before. He's like a piano player, deconstructs all sorts of music. Like he's been doing a bit of anime music recently. But... Cool. I think I know the guy. Yeah, he's got a beard. Yes. Yeah, that's as most people do. <laughs> <laughs> that's the age for yeah. But yeah, no, incredible, incredible musician. Um, yeah, actually, uh, there's a bunch of, of, you know, music creators and music educators on YouTube that, uh, you know, uh, I would say that I learned more from like a, a small group of YouTube creators yep. in the space of a year than I might have like the five years preceding that. Yeah, there's a, they're really, really lucky that there's such a wealth of knowledge and people are just, not, I suppose, not giving it out, but it's um, that it's so readily accessible. No, that's right. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, Adam Neely, of course, the name one. And then there's the, um, like, the, Rick Beato? Yeah. Uh, there's the guy that writes everything out too. Um, it's just on, on paper. That's. Oh, that's yeah, 12 time. 12 time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and then and, there's and, Sideways. And then there's a podcast, uh, an infrequent podcast, where you get. Nearly, sideways, twelve time, and it's like like a different guest each week. I'm be like Tantacruel. Yep. Or, here's another one. Who's yeah, totally. Great. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, there's um one that I was thinking of. Um, that has lost me. That has escaped me now. That's right. <laughs> oh, and then I mean, there's um Rumi as well. Yeah, and he's got like more of the pop angle, and uh, you know looking at not he definitely does look at the music academically mm-hmm. um but he's probably the only one in that group that does sort of a deep dive on the the other side of it you know like the the image how they're dressed and, yep. and you know really the marketing angle who they're playing for and and that sort of thing he oh i guess because you know, he's kind of the next generation mm-hmm. um and then you know there's some fun guys like you know rob scallon and fluff um, who are just like guitar wizards and Rhett Shul. Yeah, yeah, especially for their uh, like knowledge of of the scenes and how, and how that all that stuff works and like insider knowledge on 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 specific bits of gear. Like yep. I know Rhett Shul does a lot with um, in conjunction with Tim Pierce. Oh yeah. Um, oh, he, he's incredible. Tim he's, Pierce. Have you ever seen a happier guy playing guitar? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I used to watch it. For the music. Now I watch for the facial expressions. I mean, how could you not be filled with that many amps behind you? Oh, like, I know, it's, right? It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> little studio he's got. But yeah. What a good player. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, right. it's like, I suppose there's a reason why he's like the cream of the crop in Nashville. That's it. And then there's, there's uh, you know, of course, David. What's his name? David. But yeah, no, he's just another one of these incredibly successful, incredibly fucking handsome Um yeah, all the reasons to envy them. But he often does these compilation videos with mm. that same group of guys. Cool. Well, you know, what about, as a guitar player, Chris Buck? Mm. Right? Mm, yeah, especially. Oh. Like, he's, like, the way that he uses, um, he uses a lot of Yamaha gear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, which is, a lot of the time, pretty underrated because people think, oh, Yamaha, that's just, like, entry-level stuff. And they, they do so many things. No, Yamaha but... is, uh, they, they make gear at all levels exactly yeah well i mean they they, they own strymon and things like, so it's like all of the and vox yeah so but to, to show to see that he's using things like the helix and the um especially the yamaha like guitars yeah the rev star series those things like it's showing what's capable on yep. those and because they're kind of dismissed as, as i said like entry level, but they're definitely not actually jamie just bought uh that guitar what did he buy yeah um got to come back to me in a minute we can strat, not a strat. Uh... Oh, Pacifica. Pacifica, Yamaha yeah. Pacifica. Cool. Fantastic guitar. Yeah, I, I have one of those. That was my first guitar. Yeah. I mean, not not that one. Not I that have... one, but the 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 little Super. brother to that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's got scratches all over the neck and and um, pen markings everywhere, and so it's it's aged uh, somewhat poorly, but it's it's got mojo. They're cool. They're awesome. They guitars. are. And well, the thing is, Yamaha, because of the economy of scale, you know, they can their quality. Quality assurance is, is so high. They're yep. not just putting out every single thing they make and then recalling. Mm. They do have uh, a, a solid process where everything that comes out of yep. Yamaha, you know it's going to work. Um, it's probably going to be durable. And like the uh, Pacificas, I mean, look at other guitars in the same range. Uh, some of the some of the Squires, Chords, 
uh, Samic. Mm-hmm. None of those, uh, anything in my opinion, anywhere near the quality of the Yamaha, with the exception of maybe a say Midnight Esquire. Or something like that. Yeah, exactly. You I, know, I picked one of those up. That's yeah. so much fun. But yeah, They're pretty great. Because I mean, it's just a well, it's a Japanese make guitar. The Japs make fantastic guitars. I've got a, a GNL Climax, mm-hmm. and that's uh, ninety two okay. vintage, I would say. Yep. And that's your, you know, classic HSS, um, Floyd Rose, um, Seymour Duncan. Yep. Just metal, metal rig. Cool. You know, locking bridge. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that the one I picked up was like a ninety ninety three Silver Series Squire. Oh yeah. Um, and it's like beaten up to hell, and it's got all this, uh, like the necks all worn down. It's like been burnt a little bit but it's been loved like it, it it's, sure. it's been played in properly and it's not just been destroyed yep. it's like if it, yeah it's a gorgeous guitar well you see that's it you, you know the whole relic guitars right mm. um i have seen some of them that kind of look sort of cool but i haven't seen a single one that looks anywhere near as cool as an actual just old guitar yep you know it's like those do you remember with a uh, fade of front jeans trend oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where it's some of the like the, the like twenty different brands all doing the, like the same kind of style where you got the, and there really is just like a like a they've just like painted a bit of yellow on the front, mm-hmm. and some of the cheaper ones of those faded from the god they looked so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's poor, poor choice of color or whatever, but yeah, yeah. It's have you seen those videos of people relicking guitars mm-hmm. with like knives and yeah. like scalpels and chains? It's like that doesn't make it look any better, guys. Like if. I think the coolest relic effect is what you would do. Um, like if you were to set out to do it, mm-hmm. first, just do uh, a regular finish, Oh, obviously. Then pick like four different sandpapers. And then just like you would do shading on a picture. Yep. Yeah, just get your sandpapers and just work through in more in some areas than the others, you know? And then you've got like these different textures um, and like, if you were going to do it really well, well, maybe I'm not sure, like someone would know yep. what kind of paints you need, mm-hmm. but do like three or four layers of different color paints, you know? And so like, you got different sort of colors in different spots. Yeah. That, that, that kind of looks nice, but like the just big chunks out of it. I mean, obviously the dream would be owning a guitar for like what, 50 plus years. And... Oh, and then it just looks like that. Yeah. Because, yeah. It'd be awesome. Like it'd just be, and it'd be yours. It'd like feel, feel so much like you as part of the guitar. I... I sold a guitar once mm-hmm. and regretted it. Still regret it. Yep. Have never sold another one. <laughs> I, I may give a I may give a guitar away, yep. but I would never sell another one. Um, it's just like because the of what's the reward of selling is just like a little bit of money or whatever, mm-hmm. right? That little bit of money you get for that sale, well, certainly in the case for me, was never worth what I what I lost. Yeah. What I lost was my uh, first electric guitar. And forget any sentimental reasons. It was actually really nice. It was a, like a 1976 Seymour, which was kind of like an Ibanez yep. second. Um, it had a, a professional setup on it, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, obviously is only like a, like a $70 to $80 problem. But yeah, it's nice to get it and it's like shmi. Of course. Um, just a, a, a lovely silky tone. I made one modification. Yep. I changed the... Uh, so this was three singles. I changed the bottom single for um, uh, a much higher gain, Damasio. Okay, yep. So I ended up with one black pickup, this Damasio, and then two white ones. Mm-hmm. The guitar is like a dark wood with a with a thick black scratch plate on it. Cool. Now, as I said, I absolutely regret selling it. However, something wonderful happened. Earlier on this year, I discovered, oh, last year even, time flies, the band Woolworths Flu Shot. Yeah. Punk band. The young guitarist, he's got it. No shit. I don't know how or where he got it from. I mean, I don't know how many owners it's been through. Yep. And it's not in the condition it was, like, like tear, <laughs> shed a tear. However, it's punk as it ever was. And I'm, it's it's being played. It's, 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 it's going around getting played at gigs. Yep. So, like, what? I, I, could, I couldn't hope for anything better than mm-hmm. the fact it's, it's out there getting gigged. So that's the, the wonderful thing. Regret selling it, but yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I I find it so hard to get rid of guitars. I I'm holding on to them for the fact I want to relic them myself. Like yeah, I want, want to yeah. do that, but like, yeah. it's just sometimes bills I need to be paid. That's it's, it. Yeah, I I don't know. I've never done anything crazy. It's almost like, um, the guitars. It's built in that way. I guess it, you can make it yours, but if you like it being one thing, it it's so hard to come to terms with 
it not being the same thing if you try to modify it even the tiniest bit. No, totally. Yeah. Uh, or what? Or, or, I the the greatest crime against guitars I ever perpetrated. Mm-hmm. Well, shame even to admit this, but um, I um, <laughs> it was kind of a caveat. Hey, I was only like nineteen years old and mm-hmm. I wasn't fully mature, and but it was a kind of spiteful thing I did. Anyway, yep. so I knew this guy who was just a bit of a waster, and he um he bought this um he bought this like this is a shitty guitar. Gotcha. Reckoned he was going to play it. Never ended up playing it. Mm-hmm. And ended up pawning it to uh, to try and buy some shit, whatever he was buying, you know. Yep. And um, that happens to obviously some people, you know, they've got yeah, habits of feed and whatever and their course, music, their instruments end up in the shop. Anyway, so I knew this happened. And then uh, I went and bought it. Yeah. From the place that he sold it to. And then I turned it into an ashtray. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which bit? Wait, the neck or like? I really? literally just unbolted the neck. Uh huh. Um, took the scratch plate off, put yeah. the electrics out, and just had like a table there. Well, just used it and as an ashtray. And it was that's all I'm saying. I'm admitting it was a, um, it was a diss to him. Yep. Like, yeah, this is what I think of you playing guitar or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever goes through a twenty year old's mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, like Fender put out those officially licensed, um, not ashtrays, but cutting boards that are shaped like. Telly and strap bodies oh, that sure. you can cut vegetables on. And you know what? Well, I bet you, you could probably sell stuff like that at Salamanca. Probably could. Yeah, with if you could avoid the cease and desist from Fender or, or any other guitar company for that matter. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how much you have to change the shape to uh, say no. It's not a Stratocaster. This is a this is a Bradcaster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be the one. Mm. Oh, this brand. Um, Polish couple, Stradi mm-hmm. guitars. Yep. So they make only about 20 guitars a year. Wow. Okay. And um, these guitars, I've never seen anything like them. Just like the artistry, they look so fantastic. I'll show you a picture later, but just to roughly describe. So, for example, they now they have a, a bunch of different presets. You can okay. order a preset that costs you about 7,000 euros. Yep. Right. Yeah, far out. You can get them to do something custom, and that's closer to ten thousand euros. So it's it's not a cheap guitar, anyway. So one of their presets, um, so it's a bass. Yep. It's a semi fretless. So you got twelve frets, mm-hmm. and then the upper register is fretless. Cool. Yeah. And uh, the body, mm, the top mm-hmm. looks like. An upright base shape. Okay, yep. On the top. And the bottom um, is the bottom half of an upright base shape, and then it just kind of finishes there. Yep. So, like, you've got access to the entire fretboard. Oh, cool, yep. The whole way along from the bottom. And, yeah, no, as it looks like like the upright shape on the top, it's just, like, mm-hmm. fantastic artistry. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, anyone home, Stradi, S-T-R-A-D-I, yep. Polish brand, check them out. Okay. Um, I'd love one of those guitars, but I make way too much. But I'm inspired. I could, you know, go to a local luthier and say, you reckon you could do this shape for me? Or just pull out all the frets from, from and see how you go, refill them. Oh, well, that them. too. I, it's funny. See, I had never really thought about it before, but after I saw that design, I thought of another one. Mm-hmm. Um, what about, um, imagine if you've got all your frets, but they only go down to, your, let's say, we were talking about a four-string bass. Yeah. They only cover three strings. So imagine you've got your bottom one is fretless. Well, funny you should mention it. I was going to say, they um, John Myung, like the bass player oh, of Dream, Dream Theater, Theater, he's got a six-string bass where three of the strings are two, oh, or two or three of them. There we go. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, so he's, he's only got a few that are accessible to that. But like I can't imagine how difficult it would be to play because it's... Well, having... you've got the fret there to kind of guide where you used to be. Really the only thing you have to think about when playing fretless is you really got to be right on the fret sure yeah as opposed to somewhere it'd be behind that yeah well I, I suppose just note choice because if you've got like the benefit of fretted instruments having the same note in multiple places yep but if you that means you have to totally play some bits differently because if you can't play something because it's on a, a, fr- a fretless note because you don't want that tone it means to... also your fingering spacing will be different yeah because the thing is if it was fully fretless mm-hmm. you've actually got the same distance yep. but further up but if you've got frets and then non-frets, mm. you need a bigger stretch. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to play one. But it's cool that, that, that people are exploring that kind of world. I think it, uh, actually I went down the rabbit hole here with people doing different kind of guitar tunings and such. Mm -hmm. This one guy, he's come up with his own tuning system mm -hmm. and it's 16 tet. Like... 16 divisions yeah uh, true temperament um well, not sorry not true temperament 16 divisions equal temperament yep yeah yeah cool and so some of the notes kind of line up with western 12 tet system and some of them are just microtonal mm -hmm. um, but because it's uh equal temperament he's actually able to form some similar ratios from notes we wouldn't recognize. Like you might have like a G half sharp and a C three quarter sharp mm -hmm. together makes this particular kind of fucking ratio. I don't know. Yeah, cool. But it, yeah, it was just a really interesting idea. I mean, it, it, speaking of microtonality, not many conversations come up nowadays without mentioning King Gizzard. And sure. Their, their use, because it's so, it's clever the way that they've used it in a way that still fits into... So they were psychedelic rock kind of... Um, I mean, even Stone on Rock. Mm -hmm. Well, some of it, some of like they got they got a thrash metal album, um, as well. I have not heard their the thrash, thrash metal album. Is God. Sick! It's wow. so good. Um, it's just like old, like big four, old school big four stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's just messy as and super super heavy. Um, but the the way that they use microtones is in a really cool way because it was say like they use a third or like so a, a, a double sharp third. Yep. Or they'd um, they'd play the fifths differently, or something like that. So places where you'd expect it to be kind of normal, but it's just different enough that makes it interesting sure. to listen to. You're but... talking about like using what they call the neutral third. Ah, uh, well, probably I, I, I wouldn't know, but well, that's a, um, that all that is is uh, in between the major and the minor. Yeah, yeah. So occasionally they use that, and occasionally it's like even like a sharp fifth like yeah just, so just, well like a microtonal uh bend so you're not coming to the flat six but you well not, not even pushing. a bend so they've oh. the next oh yeah so the next they've modified that they have some microtonal frets and some full frets so that they can play specific oh, notes right. yes, as, yes, yeah. yes 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 where yeah and there's different levels of the most microtonal guitars where you'll have one that's basically looks like a, a normal guitar yep with half a dozen extra little pieces mm -hmm. But then you've got the ones that are like, oh my god, what the fuck is going on in that fretboard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he he made a guitar out of Lego that was also movable micro tunnel. Wow. Um, so it was yeah, fully functional Lego neck that you could change where the um, yeah, where, which micro tones you were using for different kinds of music. Thank you. Yeah. There's this guy that uh, made some videos um. On true temperament guitars and uh, microtonal guitars, and actually, there's a guy. Um, he played at Mona just a little bit earlier this year called uh, Mike. <coughs> Excuse me. Called Mike Ellington. Okay. And he plays uh, true temperament guitar. Um, and like you would never guess that from the music. He is like a plays like bluegrass, mm -hmm. and he does a bit of looping and. Um, <laughs> like distorted acoustic guitar soloing like it's a bit of a fun like a you know yeah blues bluegrass type of thing cool but yeah true temperament is using it's yeah it, I, I admire people that use it it's yeah it's not my bag to, to oh well i have no i'll just have an explorer but it's so it's so cool that those things are available definitely ready to explore there's something there's, uh, there's a little something you can do to sort of get a taste of true temperament mm. and it's not the same thing but it, what you can do is you just take your standard tuning, mm. drop your G mm. about 15 cents, and um, that gives your, like the major third mm -hmm. over the G, yep. much closer to a, a perfect ratio. Yep. So you get like that nice, um, uh, in a sense, it sounds flat, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like this lovely, pure sort of sound. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about true temperament is, of course, the guitar. Um, we've got this history of our one hundred years of certainly, certainly seventy or eighty years of like rock yep. um, guitar. Mm -hmm. 
you know, this is an instrument with like 20 to 24 frets. Um, straight frets. Obviously, we've got multi scales and such now, but the notes we're hearing from the guitar aren't perfect. Yeah, but yeah. they're the ones we're used to hearing, right? So you take a classic riff. Yep. Well, I don't know, fucking Stairway to Heaven or something like that. Play it on True Temperament guitar. Probably sounds nice, but probably doesn't sound as good, you know, because you kind of, ex- your ear's expecting to hear a particular kind of sound. Totally. And that, it's, it's just a different one. Yeah, okay. I've heard of people being as so, so pedantic as to uh, retune each note on the, each string on the guitar for a chord. So they, they'd play a chord and then retune, play another chord and then try to make sure that, that that's perfect. In their recording, dropping yeah. in each line. Yeah, so just dropping in a chord oh, wow. and then stopping and then dropping in another chord just, just to make it so perfect that it was... You know what that you know what that reminds me of? Mm-hmm. That seems to me like when um, you've uh, you know those icy bombs, uh, zooper doopers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If um, you've actually just let it melt and then you drink that cordial at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like all syrup. That taste. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, yeah the musical equivalent of. That's it. right. Yeah, not so much into that. Great when it's frozen, but when it's t- just like all syrup, nah. No, I get it. Yeah, it's I'd, I'd never heard what it would sound like, but it'd be cool, cool to try. I mean, like, I think it would be uh, comparable to the difference between like a sick drummer and machine drums. Yep. Yep. You want to hear a sick drummer rather than hearing machine drums. It's cool. Again, it's cool what, what can be done with those, that being said. I think they're um, like a lot of the... the there's... Uh, Especially with a lot of trap music, a lot of the, oh, the sure. crossover that I um, there's a lot of drummers that are now um, well, a lot of artists that are overlaying real real kits with with under over the top of the sampled drum. Oh, sure, the, yeah. the, the, the trap drums or whatever. Yeah, yeah just to make it. Well, I mean, for, yeah, no, no, it totally makes sense. Like, what's uh, common a trope in trap music is obviously, uh, uh, not a syncopated, but um. Uh, an irregular uh, hi hat pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, you'll get a lot of this that sort of thing. So perhaps even similar to the song kind of hats you might see in sort of power metal type stuff. Yeah, sure. But yeah, so there's so much going on in that detail, and you have these like these slides and stuff on the hats that you just haven't got hands to do anything else on the rest of the kit. Maybe you just that hat sample mm-hmm. loop just becomes like your metronome. So you just tick that <laughs> on and then, you know, you do whatever else you're going to do. Yeah. I'm talking about my hat, so I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, um, I, I think, I think it's, it's, say, it's a cool, um, way to add upon on, on what samples have become and where, where, what's happened with hip hop. Sure. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Well, I mean, yeah. So like, uh, sort of, at one point in time, it was people just like trap wasn't so much a thing. People would just talk about mumble rap. Yeah, yeah. I you know, so we were getting hip hop and mm-hmm. you know, rappers and like gangster rap and, and that sort of stuff. And then mumble rap, which was typically um, less articulate uh, performers and generally with a, a repeating uh, riff style motif in their <laughs> lyrical phrasing. Yeah. Um, and. It was, it was those two things were so separate, but now it's not so much that like modern, uh, like recent recent trap and recent rap, uh, like in my in my opinion, in my uneducated opinion, kind of similar mm-hmm. because you've got guys that have those uh, articulation chops, and they're they're doing trap now. Yep. Um, and they will still use those riff style. Almost like ostinato phrasing, the trap thing. But then they'll have these little breakaway verses. Well, they do their mad uh, rhymes. Yeah, totally. Um, and I've got to say that the addition of that has made trap music uh, as a genre in general just like a lot more interesting, certainly to me. Well, it's made a lot more accessible. I think so much so that um, you hear like that trap beat. It's it's all over the place now. Oh, yeah. It's like in well, it's in regular pop music uh, totally. too, yep. which which is which could be a good thing it's it's good that, that that's been shared around but yeah well i think uh nearly said actually something uh that was really relevant and uh, he was talking about being a musician being like you know 
a musician in terms of lifestyle or being, you know, whether you're successful or uh, in the most unlikely cases, reach that level of megastardom or whatever. Mm -hmm. Basically, his comment was such that if you look at any time in the past at the megastars of the era, those people were involved in the music that was the zenith at the time. You know, or the zeitgeist, yep. if you like, the zeitgeist of music at the time. If what you're musically doing isn't a part of that, well, whatever you're doing, you probably won't be remembered by the mainstream. You might still have some kind of, you know, there are people like, say, Frank Zappa or whatever like that. Like, he's a, like a, an exceptional case, perhaps. Well, but perhaps, yeah. but he also did a lot of do what? Like, his first album was. Right. Yeah, like, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. Frank Zappa was like a. There was a lot of psychedelic stuff and, and rock stuff really early on. And I, well, I think this has got to do with why he was, um, uh, why he's remembered and not just as an obscure artist. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, go to Mozart, obviously Mozart, super big, megastar, whatever. What kind of music was he playing? Oh, well, the music that made sense at that time in history. Um, no doubt at that time, there were guys in bands playing medieval music in their pubs or whatever. We don't know them. We don't care about them. Medieval music, we go back to, you know, fucking Dietrich Buxtecude or fucking sure. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So by the same token, if you want to be remembered in 100 years, you better be playing some kind of music that's relevant to this period that you're in. Huh. That's something I'd never thought about, but it's, yeah, it's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right, so whatever else you're going to do, make a fucking track album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that, that's the takeaway. Everybody should make a track yeah. album. <laughs> oh, and next thing is like, I'm, I'm not looking forward to this, but I mean like hyper pop, you know. I will, I kind of dig some of that. Mm. Yeah, it's like at elements of it at least. There's crossover with Vaporwave there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of interesting. I mean, once again, nearly to bring him up for the fifth time in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. His band Sungazer. Yeah. I mean, what the hell do you call that? I mean, it's modern jazz, sure, but it's so much more. It's uh, technologically aided, um, academically inspired. Frog. <laughs> like, yeah, it's forcefully fucking executed. Yeah, well, it's, that's supposed yeah, something like prog, which would generally be sort of with this too, like diminishing for for what it actually is. It is well, when you talk about prog, you de depending on what you're wearing, mm -hmm. you're probably talking about Rush. Or Dream Theater. You know, you've got like <laughs> yeah. Pink Floyd and all those great prog rock bands. And then you've got like prog rock or prog metal and like Animals as Leaders and mm -hmm. Porcupine Tree and yep. like the modern kind of prog. Um, and let me just shout out to Brecky Boy in Sydney. Um, I think they're Sydney. I like, I reckon what he's doing is prog metal, but just on the piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a, <laughs> well, um, uh, I watched, watched them play it. Um, Clarence Jazz a couple of years ago. That was incredible. The kind of stuff so mixing all that, um, like elements of well, Tigran and Hamasian, who's who definitely crosses over that same sort of thing. Um, Armenian, I, th I think. A player I'm familiar around. with. Yeah, he, he he sort of he treats the piano like a guitar. Oh I, right, sure. That's that, that's a very um, reductive Oof. way of saying it. But he there's there's a, a video of his up with the Berkeley. Um, I think it's Eastern Music on Song okay. I think. And they do like this metal track with like really chuggy eight string guitars. And he's he plays like these really heavy riffs on the piano. He plays so, so hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but then he he's like also plays beautifully soft. He plays all these um really gorgeous melody things, but a lot of it inspired by like traditional like the European music from the area is from it's it's yeah. Yeah. Which is <laughs> um that being said, that's probably all the time we have this week. All good. Thank you very much for coming along. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, you're most welcome. And um, uh, gigs, what do you got coming up? Coming up, uh, oh, playing with Cat Edwards um, in Sydney and Melbourne on the 15th and 16th. Playing with uh, Matthew Apted and my brother Seb at Pablo's on the 23rd. Is this so? Well, obviously, we got full figure there. Yeah. So, what do you add? Yeah, apt head. What, what's yeah, the name was, of that act? <laughs> that's um, uh, under under discussion, but I the one that Matt actually, that's with. a great name under discussion. <laughs> yeah, maybe it sounds like a um, like a Hall and Oates. 
cover band. Thanks, so, okay. Rob. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, he get yeah, the trio de Reves. I can't pronounce it properly, but it basically means trio of dreams. Mm. So that could be could be a good okay. one. But cool. anyway, that that's a Pablo's on the twenty third, and then Cat on the fifteenth and sixteenth. Excellent. So um, look out for Alex on uh, uh, bands. Shit, we didn't even get through these. So many. <laughs> no, that's a... fucking art school bullies. Uh, the DK effect. Mm-hmm. Um, Fall bigger dirt. Yep. And E Chavez, E Chavez. What was the name of the other? With oh, Apted, oh uh, Trio de Rivers. Trio de, yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, no, like uh, there's, there's not a uh, lack of opportunity in Hobart. I'm very. Then there's a bajillion there's... trios and quartets you play with as like a session player. I, yeah, I suppose there's yeah like uh, Dominic New and his group. One of them was SR Circo, spelled yeah, SRK, and so another fair. one called uh, Los Chicos Bonitos, which is the beautiful boys, I think. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, then like play with. Uh, like Uncle Gus and the Rim Shots and Ruby Austin Lund and anyway, that's yeah. <laughs> so many bands. But very lucky to be able to. Sure. Uh, well, yes, yeah, it's, it's been fascinating, fantastic to have you here, and um, and thanks. I'll see you guys next week.